Uh, Meg, just go ahead. You know, you know what you're doing. Go ahead. Let it roll. Okay. Over to us. Well, that was a wonderful introduction, John, and thank you for those comments. Really interesting. And um, I have to say, I ne this is one site I never thought I would see from the podium at Charleston. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was quite impressive from up here. So well done, all. Um, good afternoon, and welcome to our final plenary session of the day. We're going to spend the next hour or so, as John said, discussing one of the hottest topics in higher education today, massive open online courses or as they are affectionately known and some, somewhat awkwardly known, really, as MOOCs. My name is Meg White, and I'm joined today by a group of experts who will share a few comments to get us started, and then we will open the floor for your questions. Um, and John will make sure to answer all your questions, even in our limited time today, so no worries. Um, this is designed to be interactive, so I don't need to tell this audience what that means. Um, please, as our panelists are making their comments, note your questions and you'll have time to have a discussion with these folks and with each other um, before we close the session today. So let me get on with the introductions um, of the panel this afternoon. I'm joined by Meredith Schwartz, who is the Senior Editor of News and Features at Library Journal. And Meredith will provide us with some background and discuss the current MOOC landscape, which um, is changing every day, quite frankly. Lynn Sutton, who is dean at the Z. Smith Reynolds Library at Wake Forest University, who will talk with us about how her library is leveraging this technology even today. And then finally, Rick Anderson, who is associate dean for scholarly resources and collections at the Marriott Library at the University of Utah who will give us some takeaways and hopefully some practical advice on what the future looks like for us as we return to our day to day um, after Charleston. So without further ado, I'm gonna take a seat and pass the baton to Meredith, thank you. Can you hear me? What's a MOOC? is the reaction I got from many librarians when I was researching an article called Massive Open Opportunity, which we published. How about now? Okay. So. I was nervous about public speaking, but then when I saw all you people do YMCA, it just got better. <laughs> so, what's a MOOC? That's the reaction I got from most of the librarians I talked to when I was researching an article called Massive Open Opportunity, which we published last May. At the time, MOOCs had, were already on the radar of higher education pundits, but not many of the classes had actually started, particularly outside of the STEM fields. However, by the time the finished article appeared, only a few months later, MOOCs had already started to enter the public consciousness, or to put it another way, they'd started approaching the peak of the Gartner hype cycle. They were being touted as the solution to democratizing higher education in the face of rising costs, lifelong learning, college readiness, continuing education, grocery shopping, everything. <laughs> um, librarians were hungry to know what this hot new development meant for the library. And the answer seemed to be they have several hats to wear, supporting production of MOOCs, student use, dissemination, assessment, and preservation. So by far the most mature role for librarians was being a materials matchmaker, finding materials that could be made accessible to classes numbering in the thousands, most of whom wouldn't pay anything or were unable to pay anything, and they weren't matriculated students, so they didn't have no access to institutional holdings in print or electronic formats. So librarians got in the business of helping faculty hunt down OA materials, which would serve the same functions as the text that professors were used to using. Uh, some librarians also found that this had the side effect of encouraging more faculty members to make their own work open access. When that didn't work, they had to start negotiating for those traditionally published materials. At the time, that really wasn't happening very often. Okay. <laughs> but in the last few months, publishers have begun partnering with MOOC providers to offer content to students at no charge. Uh, notable examples include Coursera, which is doing a pilot with Cengage, Macmillan Higher Ed, Oxford University Press, Sage, and Wiley. And Elsevier is running a free textbook pilot with students in five MOOCs that are run by edX, which is a nonprofit MOOC provider. Meanwhile, digital courseback producer Sipix, Heather, are you here? Um, <laughs> crossed the <laughs> MOOCs must be free barrier by helping libraries offer content to MOOC students for a few dollars per article or chapter. Here 
later we give a shout out to some of those materials. And if you download the slides afterwards, all of these are live links. So. Professors, especially those already used to flipping their classrooms, want to include, did I skip a slide? No. Professors, especially those already used to flipping their classrooms, want to include not just videos of their own talking heads, but images, music, and other videos in their MOOC presentations. So figuring out what counts as fair use is another library bailiwick. Because MOOCs have such large audiences, are not part of a traditional educational institution, are sometimes provided by for-profit companies, even if the professor and the librarian are working for a nonprofit university, and are viewed in countries with weaker protections for fair use, some of the safe harbors that faculty has counted on for educational purposes are weaker or non-existent. All this material, by the way, shamelessly stolen from the OCLC symposium in March. <laughs> um, so that doesn't mean that we're restricted to only public domain, open access, or publisher-provided materials. The key is to use only the smallest portion of the material that you need for the pedagogical point. Don't inc include the whole Monty Python skit to get to the punchline. Only include the part that you actually need and you have a much stronger case. So the next role is pieces of the production puzzle. Libraries are helping professors produce MOOCs literally, providing the recording and editing equipment. In one case, they even, of course, the tech support. In one case, they even provided a live studio audience because the professor felt that the lectures weren't working without people to laugh on cue. <laughs> so. The next phase is MOOCs for librarianship, with use, for use within the profession, whether for paraprofessionals, for library school students, or for librarians who want continuing education. This didn't make it so much into the article, but since the article was published, there have been three MOOCs run by LIS instructors. Uh, David Lankies of Syracuse University presented his new librarianship masterclass, which was unusual compared to most MOOCs because it required that the students purchase a textbook at a discount, um, and it also offered MLS or continuing education credit to students who paid a fee and completed the examinations. Uh, Michael Stevens, who, full disclosure, is an LJ columnist, as well as a San Jose State University instructor, taught his hyperlink library MOOC. Uh, we're going to do an article on it in December with more detail, but one of the things that was interesting about that is that it was capped. It was not actually massive. It was only 500 students allowed. Um, of those, he says over 300 were active participants, so they also had a much smaller drop-off rate than many MOOCs show. Um, it was also not run by Coursera or edX or one of these MOOC provider intermediaries. It was run through BuddyPress, which is an offshoot of WordPress. Um, finally, Jeffrey Pomerantz at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill ran his course on metadata through Coursera. But although that, he is an LIS instructor, that course was not primarily aimed at a librarian audience. It was aimed to teach the general public about metadata. And I suspect that the interest was benefited by the fact that right around when this was happening, Edward Snowden's revelations about metadata were entering the public consciousness. <laughs> so. MOOCs in the public library is a still developing area. There's widespread agreement in principle that MOOCs offer a good opportunity for public libraries to build educational programming without having to recruit local experts. But as of May, I'd only found one public library that was actually doing it. And that's the County of Los Angeles Public Library, which included MOOCs into the Center for Learning Initiative of its new strategic plan. Since then, the Ridgefield, Connecticut Library used a Coursera MOOC on the fiction of relationship from Brown University as the centerpiece of its adult summer reading programs. We're gonna cover that one in December too. Um, and a student in the Hyperlink Library MOOC created a detailed plan to implement a MOOC club at Oregon, Oregon's Corvallis Benton County Public Library. But at this point, theoretical discussions about why this is such a great idea really seriously outnumber places that are actually doing it. Of course, we have no way to track how many students are using their public libraries on an individual basis to access MOOC content. So. Libraries are also starting to produce MOOCs of their own. You'll hear a lot more about that from Lynn in a minute. <laughs> But I also wanted to call out New York Public Library's Sinology 101 MOOC, which was taught by Raymond Pun when he was there. He's now gone to NYU Shanghai. Um, he also presented on it at LJ's Digital Shift Conference a couple weeks ago, and that's up online for free if you want to watch his presentation. That's where I stole the slide from. Um, and across the pond, the British Library has signed up with UK-based MOOC provider FutureLearn to create its own MOOCs based on its own materials. So now we're into very largely uncharted territory, roles for the library in MOOCs. Assessment. How to assess the success of a MOOC is a really unanswered question at this point. Um, without any filtering for readiness before people come into the classes or any credentialing incentive at the end, dropout rates are huge. 
90% is the number most commonly thrown around. I've heard it as high as 98% of the people who drop out. The thing is, though, the enrollments are so huge to begin with that even 10% left can be more students than that professor can teach in a working lifetime. So is that successful? It's not clear whether students' learning goals are even well measured by completion or whether they are getting what they need and that's why they're dropping out. And of course, the university's goals in terms of prestige or Coursera's goals in terms of profit may not relate to those metrics at all. So it's hard to say libraries should participate in assessment when we don't really know what we're assessing, but I will say the growing role of libraries as data wranglers indicates that maybe there's a place for us there when we figure out what we're measuring. Uh, the next role, which I think is bigger is preservation. Uh, preservation of MOOCs material is a key challenge because most MOOCs are pr presented by third-party providers, many of whom, since they're for-profits, may shake out as the category matures. And when they go away, what's gonna happen to that content? Um, even the ones that stay viable, they don't really have incentive to keep obsolete versions around and make them available for study. When the professor improves a class, they're not gonna offer the six pre-improved classes. So if you're a scholar studying MOOCs, you need that material preserved somewhere. Um, it's important that libraries claim a place at the table in negotiations with those providers to make sure that that content can be preserved. Creative Commons is urging that MOOC providers use CC licenses in part because it enables preservation. Um, also, the advantage to doing it now, there still aren't that many MOOCs. I believe 493 is the last number I saw. So if we can get a preservation structure going, we can apply it without having to have a massive backlog of content. Uh, very recently in the UK, someone named Russell Boyett run the repository fringe developer challenge with a proposal to build a MOOC preservation toolkit, which would re reach into MOOCs, particularly open source ones, put them together with social media interactions around the same content, and use SWORD to push it into a repository together. So, back to the Gartner hype cycle. Today, MOOC excitement seems to have begun the slide into MOOC skepticism. Faculty have raised concerns about who owns the intellectual property being offered in MOOCs, and about MOOCs having the potential to redu reduce the diversity of scholarship to a few rock star professors from brand name institutions. Concerns have also been raised about how well MOOCs actually work to democratize education. A study by Columbia University's Community College Research Center found that all students perform less well in online courses than they do in person, and the gap is wider among those with lower GPAs, men, and African American students. When San Jose State and MOOC provider Udacity offered several four-credit courses online to high-risk students, pass rates were dramatically lower than in-person rates for not-at-risk student population. These concerns have led to experiments with tweaking the format of MOOCs, from a distributed open collaborative course billed as a feminist anti-MOOC, to SPOCs, which is small private online courses, and even SMOOCHES, which is <laughs> Synchronous Massive Open Online Conference. I swear I did not make that up. <laughs> They've also led to calls for embedded librarians or library students doing virtual internships to provide support to MOOC students as they would for students in a paying online program or on a physical campus. However, as Forrest Wright pointed out in a DLib article, even in online courses with paying courses with limited enrollment, time demands have been a challenge for this kind of support. So personalized one-on-one -on -one reference assistance is probably not happening for MOOCs at this point. Uh, what we can do though is to create scalable options like libguides and tutorials that are MOOC focused and don't point to institutional holdings that those students can't access. And then reach out to faculty to make sure those are included in the course resources. So. This is a fast moving field. It's so fast moving that there are two things I want to include on this that happened after I finalized the slides. So in addition to these, Educause has recently released a massive MOOC review, which I highly recommend. And Coursera has launching an overseas physical locations to take MOOCs in. I'm not exactly sure how that's not a college, but <laughs> we can talk about that later. So. MOOCs raise at least as many questions for higher education and for libraries as they answer. They may ultimately end up with floppy disks on the list of technological in innovations that briefly transform their industries only to be supplanted. Or they may become ubiquitous and eventually give rise to the next generation of learning tools. Already there are calls to disaggregate the MOOC, turning it from a course into more of a course pack or a library for the flipped classroom. We can't hang back to see where MOOCs end up any more than the right answer in the 1990s would have been to ignore floppy disks, because they matter now, regardless of where they're going. Supporting MOOC production is fast becoming a core library role at many institutions, and stretching beyond that to supporting use, dissemination, assessment, and preservation gives libraries an opportunity to help shape developing policy and priorities. That's all she wrote.
Thank you.